Sky Howdy, and welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. Well, welcome back, everybody. We're having a really serious discussion about field research. This is why I got my cryptid wilderness research hat on. And I got a serious scientific guy here with me that only believes in analyzing the evidence that's there. And then he gets evidence of his own to analyze. And what I'm referencing is, of course, everybody knows that I'm with the amazing M.K. Davis, and that MK has spent years doing breakdowns on the Patterson-Gimlin film, which, of course, is the number one piece of video evidence of Bigfoot extant at this point, more studied than the Zapruder film. And MK has done a lot of excellent work on it. The whole community owes him a big nod and a lot of clapping and cheering for all of the work that he's done. But he's not just a guy that sits in the studio on his bum and plays with his computer all the time. He actually goes out and does field research, too. And in 2008, he decided to do a little field trip with a couple of his friends over to Bluff Creek, where the PG film had been shot, to investigate the area, take a look around to see if he could find any more Bigfoot there. Well... He ended up filming a couple of them, so I think that was fairly successful. Welcome back to the show, MK. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on, Duke. Happy to have you back. I always enjoy talking to you. And, you know, uh, we do actually spend time on the phone talking to each other besides when we're doing shows. And it's always a blast talking to MK. He's an extremely smart guy, straight shooter, doesn't BS on anything. So when you get it from him, you can be 100% certain it's been investigated inside out, backwards, forwards, upside down, and probably had tin types printed of it too, or maybe a plaster cast. So take it to the bank pretty much is what I'm saying. So always a, th a thrill for me to have MK on, the eminent MK Davis. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry to keep gushing, but I'm a fan. Anyway, <laughs> what we got a show today is really cool. He was, you know, doing his job, walking around, filming the area, investigating everything. And when he went back and looked through his video, he actually found a couple of Bigfoot that he had filmed and didn't even realize he caught them. Yeah, but I should have. And, and I fought myself. Uh, I have a lot of regrets. Uh, I should have. I should have known because we'd seen a lot of sign. You know, you see a lot of fresh sign. <laughs> well, naturally, you should think that they may still be there. You know, if it's uh, fresh sign, yeah, that's if, an it's fre if it's pretty fresh sign. Uh, you know, uh, I, 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 like I said, I, I, I'm one of those uh, researchers that, that I denied being a researcher for many years. I mean, I, I really it was. I'm a kind of reluctant researcher, but if Inevitably, if you stay at this, you're going to end up being a, you know, a field researcher because that's that's where that's where you get the the kind of evidence that can, will convince you. Uh, you know, uh, looking at other people's stuff is fine, and I I, I enjoy that. I think it's important, but uh, when you find your own, uh, it it carries a lot more weight. And so if if I find a track, I say, well, that's that's a fantastic thing. But does it if it leads me to Bigfoot, that's even better. Yeah. You know, that that that's what you're looking to, to get is uh, some kind of visual. Uh, it, it, audio if is good, but it's you never see anybody convicted very much over audio evidence. You know, there's an uh, an ear witness said he heard you <laughs> enter the building. You know, <laughs> it, it just don't go that far. Uh, 
I think the best audio is probably Ron Moorhead's. You know, that's the most convincing. Zero uh, there, there, I'm sure there's others out there as well, but uh, you know, it's 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 not without merit. But uh, being able to see with your cameras, <laughs> with your eyes, is is better. Hundred percent agree. And yeah, I'm going to be having Ron on the show here soon to talk about the Sierra Sounds and Quantum Bigfoot and whatnot. So y'all can look forward to that. We'll get into that in the future here. That's interesting. I, I love to hear him talk about it because it's a, it's a, a, he's at the forefront of a field that a few years ago was not even recognized. And now, now it's carrying a lot more weight. And he's got the best audio recording of the Bigfoot actually speaking to each other, not just making random whoops or howls or something that anybody has ever captured. Yeah, uh, I agree. And it's, uh, I can only imagine what it was like to be there, you know, while it was happening. I've heard of doing their their uh, Sasquatch jibber jabber to each other before, but the couple times that I've heard it, it was so quiet and low in the background, you know. And I I don't think I could have even got an audio recording of it not with my camera or anything. Well, they were uh, seemed to be pretty pretty uh, loud, you know, up on that mountain, ten thousand feet up. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's it's like they weren't worried about the humans being there, hearing them or anything. They were making all kinds of racket. No, I, th- I think they they were as enamored with those hunters as the hunters were with them. Mm-hmm. You know, they were discussing it pr- pretty openly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, Ron, I was just looking the other day at, uh, I was reading Ron's book, Quantum Bigfoot, and he's got a picture in there from their Sierra camp that they took of a 25 and a half inch track with his foot next to it for scale. And oh my God, you know, you start seeing tracks that big and it just gets like really overwhelmingly creepy of how big these guys are. And speaking of which, uh, before we get further into it, speaking of big tracks, I know you just got done watching the beginning of my show. And I had somebody actually show up in the comment section and tell me that that 22-inch track was a bear track. And I had to point out three things to them. First of all, the biggest grizzlies in Montana are 1,000 pounds. The biggest grizzlies that there are in North America are the coastal Alaskan brown bears, grizzlies that they have there. They get to about three-quarters of a ton. And their rear footprint maxes out at about 18 inches. So you're saying this is the largest grizzly in North America that's somehow living here in Montana. And not only that, but that grizzly doesn't have any claws. Because it was quite evident from looking where its toes dug in to get purchased to push it up that hill. There were no claw marks there. It would have been impossible to not leave claw marks. Exactly. With grizzlies, they've got like sabers on the end of their feet. They haven't got those little stubby claws like a black bear does. The way they push the push down to get get the purchase on that hillside, yep, would have just pressed those claws in. Yep, uh, it, it would have been easy to see. Perhaps the track of the infamous Crazy Toe. Not to be confused with Crazy Horse. Crazy Toe.
Well, anyway, my point being, a lot of the stuff that these armchair people come up with as excuses for why it isn't real can easily be debunked by just looking at what's logically known about what they're trying to say, which is he's trying to compare this to a bear track. Well, congratulations. That's the biggest bear in North America. I honestly, I honestly think that Bigfoot is smart enough to know that his foot, if with a little bit of effort, can be used, can be made to look like a bear. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you just walk on the ball and don't put the entire foot down and and just kind of hit scuff like that, it, when you get through, it looks every bit like a bear. Exactly. Uh, I've seen I've seen them do it. As a matter of fact, uh, it's in the Patterson film. Mm-hmm. Some of those tracks were half tracks. They just the ball and the toes. And and if, if they had been successful at making the whole trackway that way, it's a little harder to walk that way. Yeah. Uh, a person would have come in and said, well, you know, we we jumped a bear up on the sandbar down there. She's out in the woods there somewhere. You know, they get away with things that way uh, because Bigfoot don't necessarily come straight to your mind. No. But a bear, a bear would if you saw the track. Speaking of weird things that they do with walking uphill, I had Keith Crabtree up here with me, and he actually discovered the tracks. There was this dirt embankment, very steep, about eight feet high, and it had three holes in it. And when you went and looked closely, what they were was a juvenile Bigfoot had been using his feet like pitons, essentially, and just driving the front of his foot into the dirt. And then stepping up and doing the same thing again three times, and he was up on top of it. And up above that, laying flat on the ground a fairly good distance away, I found another one of his tracks going uphill. And he had a track that was about 10, 11 inches long, so it wasn't particularly huge. But that's an example of some of the weird stuff they do with their feet. I mean, like he was driving his toes in and just walking with the ball of his foot stuck in the hill, three steps, and he was up. And it just looked so peculiar. I'm like, yeah, Keith, uh, I think those are Bigfoot tracks because I have no idea what the hell <laughs> made this otherwise. Let's take a closer look at it. Yeah, that's what they were. Well, they go up they go up uh, cliff faces. And you know there must be some tremendous strength yeah. the, from the toe, toe area of a yeah. foot because they can hang on to almost anything that's just a little raised or or sticks out a little bit. And and they you know they it, it supports their body weight and they yep. they go <laughs> right on up and gone. Uh, it's been a lot of a lot of uh, accounts of people seen them. You know, one person saw three, one, two, three, one above the other, above the other, going up this cliff face and hit the top and gone. Yep, and they're they climb like apes. <laughs> <laughs> They're good at climbing. Let's put it that way. Getting back to one thing that you mentioned before we go on to everything else, the uh, their ability to just walk on the balls of their feet and make it look like a bear track. A perfect example of that is when I climbed up to the top of that embankment below which was the 22-inch track because I had noticed a fresher 19-inch track going up it, got up on top and started following that track line. And that's what most of them look like. You could just see the front of the foot where you put the ball down and the toes had dug in and disturbed the ground a little bit. And if there was any other thing there, it was just the outline of the foot crushing the ground. down. Stands out pretty good certain times of the day. And again... Here's that other track that we found many, many days ago, now falling apart. Johnny's up there somewhere. He's going to walk down to the end of the ridge and back again, see if you can find any more tracks. 
the big ones cross down there sometimes, so he's thinking there might be tracks from them up above, so he's going to check that out. Down here two weeks ago, we found this monster. But look what's up above it. It's new. Took out part of the embankment. Scrambling up. I'm going to try and get up this thing. It'd be very steep. Well, there's a giant footprint there. Like another one here. Hard to see it. Crown, ground crushed. And where did he go from there? Who knows? They're so good at hiding their tracks. That might be it. We're crushed on grass. Trying to find tracks in the Rocky Mountains. Woohoo. People always say, how come Bigfoot only leave one track? Because they only left one obvious track. You guys are worth a crap at tracking, so you can't find where they went from there. And I think I pretty much made my point. It's not easy. You need to know what you're doing, what you're looking for. And keeping in mind that even with all their huge size and weight, they're extremely good at hiding signs of their presence and their passing through an area. And they do their utmost to achieve the goal of being stealthy little forest ninjas, or I should say stealthy giant forest ninjas, and not letting us know where and when they're around but I'm gonna go walk let's walk along this hillside here for a little bit see if we can find anything else Side going back toward where I just came from. I think the reason a lot of uh, a lot of the researchers hesitate to show you guys stuff like this is because it basically doesn't show up worth a damn on camera because cameras are two-dimensional, so you can't see 3D stuff. You can see there's been a lot of traffic through here. Things mowing this area down. So they'll find a track and they'll point it out or something and, you know, people just go, I can't see anything, there's nothing there. So if you draw an outline on it, they're like, 
You're just outlining that there's nothing there. Yeah, whatever. No pleasing them. Same kind of people that would, uh, they would complain if you hung them with a gold plated rope. Yeah, that's one of the things we find frequently. You look at this and you go, is that, is that a bear track? And then you look more carefully and you see, no, it's not a bear track. No claw marks and there's an actual heel and everything else. Yeah. A, a Bigfoot is, is hyper aware. He's, he, he's aware of every part of his body and, and, and the feet especially. Uh, so he's, he's on broken ground or, or he, he maps the ground in front of you. You look at you look at Patty, she takes four steps without looking back down at the ground in front of her. And all that flotsam and jetsam that was on that sandbar and the, and the broken ground, she took four steps without a stumble, without anything, looking over at those guys without looking down. They know exactly where they're putting their feet. Uh, they rarely ever stumble. Yeah. Uh, they they and they they put those feet that and like like they make the, the the half track. Their 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 mind is is making the track and then making it appear to be a bear's track. You know, making it changing the 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 gate and the extension. You know. Uh, I've got one place in the Patterson film where it does a step over. Uh, it, it puts the right foot on the left side and the left foot over on the right side and then comes off the hill and straightens out. And it just looks crazy. Uh, that, that It's got the right foot on the left side and the left foot on the right side. And it was did it for a reason. Uh, it was in the the early uh, part of the filming. It came up to a, a little bluff, a little a little drop off, and it was right on top of that drop off where you can see it. And and it, then it goes down the drop off, and you can't see the feet anymore. But it uh it it was hyper aware of its feet, and it was leaving leaving that for some reason. And I've always said that it looked like she was looking for arrowheads. <laughs> you know, she had her head down, kind of watching her feet, and her feet was were they they weren't not like the second the second walk sequence. She's stretching out, and uh, she's doing the uh, extension leg extension. But in that first one, it was like a just unsteadiness. It, it, it was leaving a, a trackway of of an illusion of unsteadiness. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I'll, I'll have to show you that those tracks, where you can see them pretty good, uh, where they've got the their crisscross like this. That's freaking cool. Just yep. like that. It's wild. And well, you know, if you're not used to uh, tightrope walking like they usually do, uh, trying to do something like that as a human will lend you to fall on your face. So that that again proves that one no guy in a suit. <laughs> no, no, uh, it, 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 a guy in a suit with especially a large suit like that, a heavy suit, that would have to be. It, it would, uh, you can't get out of that straight line <laughs> without falling on your butt. Yeah. Uh, it take you down. Yep. You know, you get you get a little over 
over uh, over the top, you know, past the point of, of pivot, the center line. And next thing you know, you're drifting that way and that way. Those things are heavy. Oop, yeah, you go over sideways. They're not light. All right, well, let's get on to what happened while you were there. Um, do you want to talk about the river one first, or is there anything else you wanted to lead up to it with? Uh, well, the the river one actually occurred last. The film okay. that, well, that let, I did there. Let's uh, let's go chronological then, because you're up there messing around with somebody's house. I mean, cave. <laughs> it was uh, uh, we well, it starts the the video that I that I posted to YouTube here uh, recently starts with us in the bed of in in Bluff Creek. We were crossing the creek itself, and I looked down. And there's floating in the water coming down the creek is this what it had the appearance of a fetus with an umbilical cord attached to it. MK found this in the stream next to the to the rocks on the shoreline. Uh, we're going to put this in a baggie and take it back for whatever reason. Uh, who knows? But it's possible MK even suggested human. I, will, uh, I don't know. know. I have no idea know that. And, but the thing is, we're in an area now with, with all kind of abstracts, anomalies. Do we know? We do not know. Right, you want me to put a rock in it and throw it? Uh, Ken I'll says... On. Okay. Yeah. Literally. I'll come across and get it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a fetus, Ken. I don't know anything about fetuses. Well, I'm not anything medical. It doesn't have any limbs. It's too too young to even have limbs. It wouldn't be more than six weeks old, right. in my estimation. I don't think it's yeah. in it's the got an umbilical cord. Okay. In, in the womb, it wouldn't be more than six inches long, or six ounces long. I mean. Is it dog like? Can't tell, really. You're the most doctor guy along. Who tell us about it? Bring it here, and I'll put it on the exam table. I'm handle it over. Doctor Ken. There you go, Don. Seal it, Rich. Seal it up. I'll let him seal it. I'll take it to him. That's it? Yep. It's a fetus. It's real small. Yes. In this filtered image, you can see that it does have appendages, and the umbilical cord is tucked underneath it. Uh, it's, it's not joining on the rear end, but it's joining somewhere underneath on the other side. You can see, almost see inside of it. Uh, it This image haunts me every day. And I looked at it. I said, Don, look, it's a fetus. And I pick it up and set it on a rock. You know, got it out of the waters because it was drifting downstream. And Don come over and looked at it, and he agreed that it looked like a fetus to him. And and uh, Ken Eddings had already crossed the creek, so he he really didn't want to get back in the creek again. So he was hollering at us, "What do y'all got over there?" You know, we uh, tried to explain to him that it was a fetus. Which is, I mean, how do you explain that? Uh, I, I was I, I was kind of at a loss to, you know, as, as to what it. I really didn't know for sure that it was a fetus. I mean, I I can't think of many fetuses that I've seen, but I know from biology books and stuff. You know, they have a umbilical cord. Right. I didn't see at the time that it had a a little appendages. Uh, but later, you know, later on in the video, I zoom in on it. You can see them. It looks like little seal flippers. Uh, and you can see kind of tra semi-transparent through that little skin, something inside darker. 
I really should have just cut it open because we had no way to preserve it. And we tr we tried to put it in a Ziploc bag and Don ended up throwing it away. I think he opened it up and it like it made him throw up. Uh, so it's, it's spoiled rapidly. That tells me right there that it was fresh. Well, yeah. Yeah, because it wasn't river. spoiled. Uh, and there, there goes back to the, the quality of your research. You know, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a self-deprecating type person, but in all fairness, you know, I didn't start out to be a Bigfoot researcher. Uh, I, I kind of became one, you know, uh, and I didn't take a course of any kind. Uh, Wait, they have a course for this? No. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I thought maybe I missed something. They, they have no course for this. That's, okay. that's the. So I, I kind of just started to build a little body of knowledge, but I, I had no reason to expect for me to know ex instantly that I had a Bigfoot fetus or or maybe a bear fetus. Uh, how would I know the difference? You know. Yeah. Uh, I really, uh, you need somebody, you know, that's, that's all knowing <laughs> that will recognize it, you know, and tell you what it is. Now, yeah, good luck with that. You have to find some world renowned expert on FETI uh, to take a look at it. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, as it turned out, if you look at the video, you'll see Ken on the other side and I took it over there and handed it to him. Okay, he goes like this. What oh, he goes and looks straight upstream. Now he hears something upstream, and it, it snaps his attention around. And upstream is where I later on filmed the Croucher. Mm. Same the same day, uh, and that makes me think that they're all three related to each other the fetus floating downstream the croucher and his reaction which people will react sometimes without without fully knowing why themselves you know he heard something that was out of out of place and he snapped around and looked upstream um uh, we went on up the mountain after that and this was my third attempt to go up that mountain the uh don I mean don had fallen on the first attempt and is that where he went off the cliff yeah <laughs> <laughs> dangerous don and uh, uh, the, don the second, the, it's, it's a difficult thing to get up there because it's so it's almost like cliff climbing you know you have to you touch the ground right there in front of you and uh, so we made it on the third attempt. And on the way up, we came up, came across these big culverts. Uh, they were on the side of the mountain, wrapped around trees. Uh, so they had rolled down the mountain and hit the tree and it broke, you know. Um, Don climbed up in it. He said he th he thought he could see where somebody had been sitting in there, and I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, it's instant shelter. Yeah. But uh, uh we had also read where uh, during this during this road construction that the Bigfoot had been vandalizing equipment, and they came during the night and threw culverts. Brand new culverts down the side of the mountain. And these culverts, you know, no telling what they weighed. And that must have been that. What that must have been the culverts they were referring to. Well, let's just flip it and say, how likely is it that somebody's got a whole pile of old culverts they want to dump somewhere and they drive up there just to hurl them off the side of the cliff? Yeah, uh, these weren't in bad shape. 
Yeah. Uh, even even after all them years, I mean, they weren't rusted out or anything. This is a culvert. Uh, how far up the hill we say we are, Don? An hour and a half. Well, in terms of oh, distance. Uh, thousand feet. Something like that. Well, up yeah. on the side of the hill, you see that this is not virgin country. Let's see here. Oh, it's pretty, it's pretty long. It's 60 feet at least. Good side here. Hello. <laughs> now that's something interesting. What, do, what are you seeing, Don? I'm not sure yet. Can you come over here and look in there? There's something stuck. Is that a rock? Is that a rock or is that uh, something else dug in there? I'll go back there and see what that is. Hold on. I got let a duck me zoom in. You get zoomed past you, Don. I can't do it. It, it just the light's not any good. Can you get a light on it a little better? That's all. It doesn't doesn't uh, telescope. It doesn't doesn't uh... project. It's what you see is what you get. No pun intended. Uh huh. They look like rocks, but I can't tell. I'll go in there and take a look. Pull the stick to one side a little bit. Well, here's something else, uh, MK. The water that runs out of here runs the other way. It comes down to this crack and the pipe goes both directions. Yeah, I can oh. see the other end from here. Yeah. The water that enters this pipe doesn't come through it directly. It comes through the side view. Well, we know nothing's in it, so come on out, Don. Unless something happened to you in there. Well, it won't. You ought to photograph this hole. MK. Yeah. You ought to photograph this hole. I can. I don't have enough light in there. I don't have a flash. I got a camera. I got a small camera I can take a picture. Well, we're going to make our way on up to the upper end of this thing. Okay, I'll come out. Or something grabs me. What size is this pipe? About three foot? Mm, a little more than that, I think. I don't know. Probably about four. four. No, not four. Three and a half, then. Yeah, not four feet. But you're right, the effort to get this thing here to mega machinery. It's been here a long time. Been here a long time, man. 1940 or something? Long, yeah, yeah, good long while. 50s probably. That's when they first started coming in here, I understand. When? The late 50s, mid to late 50s. And they're big hoists and they're skitters because you got to get it up out of these canyons to the, to the landing. So maybe they, this was part of that. They had to have some sort of road structure to get in here, obviously. And to cross some of this stuff. And it could be just an opening in the trees, too. There could be any number of things without really looking through the hand. It's all speculation. But see, there's a landing up, an opening up here above it. Fairly good opening. Uh, I think that it must have been the ones they were, were talking about, but very likely. We we went we went on up from there, and we came out of this ravine onto this uh, this old logging road, 
cat skinner road, I think they call them. And the road originally went all the way down to the creek, but it no longer did. It was it was stopped. And we we kind of got sat there and ate a ate a bite, ate a snack, and we were talking. And uh, they sat down to uh, try to doctor up their feet. Their uh, their feet were hurting them. And I went just down through there talking, filming and talking. Now, uh, a couple of years before that, I didn't even have a video camera. Didn't own one. Well, great timing on having one yeah. when you were so there. So well, now I had one. And, you know, what What am I to do with it other than talk? You find yourself talking like a little bit like uh, Paul Friedman. You know, you're just yeah. kind of talking to nobody. Uh, and I'm making an argument for Bluff Creek, not really having uh, no real reason for it to have any more Bigfoot than any other place. You know, uh, because, you know, uh, they 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 had a kind of a heyday of Bigfoot activity when they were being invaded by the by the construction company and by the logging companies, you know. Yeah. And that was my theory. And it sounded good to me. <laughs> but all, all the time that I'm talking, you know, I'm looking up in the trees down and I make my way on around and find this uh this uh i'll call it a lair i mean it instantly struck me as being a lair but when i went in there it was open and it wasn't straight up it was like this and uh it had a, a deer carcass in there and tracks and i saw the tracks go up the hill and it was cutting into the embankment you know yeah uh and I uh, I got infatuated with this waterfall at the back of the little little room there, the little clearing was a waterfall, and it was making this gurgling, beautiful thing. Uh, and I could hear on my video the snapping of a tree limb, you know, pow. It uh, it didn't occur to me to turn around and and look for it. I was infatuated with the waterfall. I guess what I'm saying, I didn't have a lot of experience behind me, right? As, as far as uh, being a Bigfoot researcher, uh, to me that waterfall, it looked like something you might want to build in your yard, you know. Yeah. Uh, a mountain waterfall. Yep. Uh, and I didn't find this till later on, but the, the Bigfoot had, while I was coming into the lair, it made an exit out of the lair and went up the embankment and turned and snapped off a tree and turned around was just looking at me. And I, I didn't even acknowledge him. I didn't. I didn't see it. <laughs> but you did bring the camera across him about four but times. I, I did. I brought <laughs> the camera across him several times. Uh, okay, let me attempt to narrate this. We just came from Bluff Creek down this ravine, uh, up this ravine. You're looking down it. Up this ravine, uh, all the way up to this old Cat Skinner Road, this logging road that's on the side of the hill or the mountain. And uh, this road is, this is was obviously made with a lot of trouble to get these logs out of here. Uh, you can see it's an old road, it goes around here, down in the culvert, down the gully there, there are two culverts and, uh, and they kept the road from washing away by them culverts and you see what we're talking about here. This is, my understanding is done back in the 50s, so I don't really know how old it is. You 
Get a picture of your trail mate sitting over here. Uh. Hey, there's a Bart. Well, as you can see, the roads up here are, are, are surround the Bluff Creek area. They ring it on either side, and there's uh, plenty of accesses down to the creek. And uh, these roads have been here for quite a while. Uh, so it's, it's not like that this area of the country is undeveloped or never been touched or it's pristine. Uh, I think perhaps at the time that these roads were first being built, that this area may have been uh, very little traversed by people and maybe that's perhaps why the Sasquatch were in here in the numbers that they were and I know that uh, bringing heavy equipment into an area sensitive area like that probably did create some situations um, so but but as to the conditions that are here right now um, you know, you go up the hill from Bluff Creek on either side, and you run into roads. There's access roads to the creek. There's bridges across the creek. Uh, people have been in and out of here, and in recent years, probably more than ever. So uh, this is why, why even though this is rugged country, and it's beautiful country, and it's and it's it's not totally pristine. It's uh it's not the last uh, stand for truly wild America by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, there are places still like that though. But it's a historic place. Uh, at one time Sasquatches were here. Probably are here on occasions. I don't know. Um, I'd like to think so. I've heard some things down here to lead me to believe that I was perhaps in the presence of them. But cannot prove it. So th that that's pretty much where I stand that um, the, the, Sasqu the Sasquatch, at least the area of Bluff Creek, as far as uh, Sasquatch habitat, is probably not any better than any other place at this time. Uh, rugged country, uh, Sasquatches undoubtedly live a pretty dismal life. Uh, I guess they like it, but to me it would be dismal. Uh, so, uh, with that being said, you know, and I give you a little last minute view. You can see just how rugged and steep it is here. There's the trees way up above my head. Fall colors just returning. Just beginning to tree leaves just beginning to turn. So, 
after after I got that one done, now of course I, I left out part. I left out the part that we found down at is down at the bottom of the creek. Uh, uh, in an earlier attempt to come up the hill, we found those uh, broken off trees. But well, I'll get back to that later. It, it was uh, we came. I came down down the mountain ahead of them because they were busy bandaging up their feet and. I just decided I was just going to go down there and wait on them and film them when they Coming came out the yeah. and they came out into the creek. So I came down and when I got to, I, interestingly enough, I don't really remember the descent too well. Uh, obviously, I went down it. But, you know, it's like this. So I must have just slid. Uh, <laughs> But but anyways, uh, when I got down, I went across the creek, and on the other side was a trail alongside the creek, and I, I walked that thing all the way back up, almost to where we had come in with our cars, with our vehicles, and I went back out into the creek, and I looked down the creek and I looked up the creek and I did some filming up and down. And then I walked toward where the guys would be coming out at. Finally ran into them coming out, filmed them. Still didn't think much about it. And at a later date, when I was looking at the video, I saw something white move. And I stopped the film, went frame by frame, and it was something flexible like a cloth or maybe leather, something light colored, light toned. And there was a, this shadowy figure in the shade wrapping something up with this cloth. And it was animated, whatever it was, was doing like this in the in the cloth and uh i said what in the world and i i captured some frames and i blew it up and i could see pretty i could see its calf muscle was huge and uh and there was no no lines of delineation where clothing would have been along the waist along right. the the cuffs of the foot of the leg. Uh, it was all mon mono, monotoned. And uh, I realized that it was not a human being. It was, it was one of them. And it was in perfect position to have had that fetus get away from it. And it would have floated right down to where we crossed at earlier the, in the day and then that would be the direction that ken looked when he was su surprised and he looked upstream he heard something uh so it, it all kind of fit to me later on you know as i kind of put things together uh but it was anticlimactic because it was a good bit later that I even found this. So I didn't get to come out of the woods. So I got Bigfoot. You know, I got Bigfoot right here. I went on down to the to the creek out ahead of those guys uh, that were with me. They stayed up there and nursed their feet and dressed them. And I came on down and I, I stood out in the creek and was going to film them as they came walking up the creek. And something shows, you can see it in the lower right hand corner of the screen, it, something shows in the video, although I didn't physically see it or consciously see it. It's, it's very dark under there. You'll see that it's got something white in its hands, uh, like a cloth. And it seems to be wrapping something up. 
there's a, a brightened image, a filtered image. You can see that it's got uh, a very large calf and it's got a, a shorter lower leg and a longer upper leg. Very long feet. See if the white thing it's got right here? It's like a, a towel or cloth. Remember there were 10,000 firefighters in there just a couple of months earlier. I'm sure that they left something there. Look in the lower right hand corner. See it's wrapping? There you see an enlarged version. You can see that it's animated. Whatever it's got wrapped in the cloth is animated. And this one, uh, it, after the clacking of the two rocks, it backs back up into the brush beside this log and disappears. If you look, there's a log right on the other side of the, the knees there. And it goes right on into that brush. And that's going to... Uh, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. This is taken directly from behind, uh, which uh, shows the width of the shoulders and the girth, that this is really a, kind of a husky figure. It, okay. it's it's it is anticlimactic because i it was so long ago yeah and I, I got bigfoot like six years ago i got bigfoot Yay. It's, it's not the awesome, same though still awesome uh, man yeah well it, it it is but interestingly enough uh you know you would think that that the bigfoot community would would be jumping for joy at, at even even though it's darker, it still it has elements that the Patterson film don't have. You know, it's performing a task. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you think that that would be like have some kind of merit? Yeah. But but re it really, it, it, I don't think anybody wants a replacement for the Patterson film. Well, you too know, bad. They're going to get one anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think that it should be replaced with something better. Yeah. Uh, but I, th I, I do believe that there's there are people who who would just rather le let things be like they are. You know, they're ha they're having a fun time and and uh, and and so advancements, progression. You know, make a, a quantum leap. Uh, it, it's it's not appealing. Mm. Yeah, there are some people that are just in it for the mystery, and if they do in fact find out, you know, well, it's settled science now. It's this, and that'll ruin it for them. I, I think so. I think I think it's a little bit of a fear of uh, solving the thing, you know, uh, which is strange to me. Well, it makes sense to me because there's a bunch of people that are into the community essentially just to make money off it. So at the point where it becomes something that, uh, that isn't a mystery anymore, 
that they can make money off of, that makes them unhappy. So they want the mystery to continue so they can keep making money off it. I, I know that there were there were two that I got on film, but there there were probably at least three because uh, whenever this one was facing away from me and the babbling of the uh, creek was kind of drowning everything else out. Yeah. It didn't. It didn't see me either. It didn't know I was there un- until there was a sound of two rocks clanging together. You know, clack. Yeah. And then it instantly reacted and went back into the brush. So, so the sentinel caught you and let the other one know. So you're probably right. There probably was the, another one there. There was one that was that that, that warned, did the warning. Yeah. You know, with two two good sized river rocks. Yep. Pow. Uh, which you can you can hear it there on my videotape on YouTube. Uh, so it, it it tells me it, it tells you an awful lot. It tells you that they have organization and they have a, a sign, assigned tasks. You yep. know, uh, one one does that. The other ones. Do their thing, and if 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 he even makes a peep or clacks a rock, they all go for the bushes. Yep. And then they have this incredible ability to not blow their cover. I walk within ten or fifteen feet. I walk down the creek right by it. Yeah. I'd also yeah. like to point out that Harry Larry there, although he ain't walking across an open stretch of land so you can film him like Patterson's Gimlin's Patty was. He's just standing still, which is what Bigfoot usually do. They usually don't move. They just stand still. And I believe he was probably closer to you than Patty was to Roger or Bob when they filmed her. Well, yeah, I would say so. But it it, it might as well have been a, a mile or two as far as I was concerned because I was right there, and I panned the camera on him. No doubt, I looked myself. But but you know, you don't looking and seeing are two different things. Yes. You know, uh, I I just was enthused about that waterfall and the beauty of the place, and and uh, even though I saw fresh tracks in there. And you just heard a wood snap. And I just heard a pow tree. Uh, and it's in the video. You can see the broken tree broken off. Which is where? Right in front of Harry right, Larry? Right in front of Harry Larry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's but, sneaky. That's that's one of the points I'd like to drive home here. MK is totally into this. He's looking for signs. He's, you know, checking everything out to see if there's a Bigfoot around. I've done this a bunch of times. Blaine Tyler's done it. Some of the best Bigfoot researchers ever have done this, where you just don't see them. And then you go back and look at your video afterwards and goes, there's one right there. How did I miss him? I mean, I was there filming this looking for him, and I somehow didn't see him. I don't know what I would have done had had I saw him. (laughs) You know, uh... I mean, because I didn't, I didn't have any way of defending myself if it had been a violent encounter. Uh, it was just uh, if I had seen him, I don't, I just don't know what. I'd, maybe I'd have tried to talk to him or something, or I don't know, yell, holler, uh, run. Well, since you're doing your uh, Paul Freeman monologue at that point, you probably would have went, "Ooh, there he is." <laughs> no, I probably would have went. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, you can't. You, know, you can't blame Paul Freeman. Uh, you know, I know when, I, when you hear Paul Freeman, t- a lot of people use that against him that he talked to the camera, but it's almost natural. Yeah. Uh, if you know you don't have anybody with you, but you have an audience within this camera, you're yeah. going to show the film. Yeah. And explain to them where you're going, what you're right, doing, right. what you're it's, experiencing. It's just, just kind of natural. Yeah. And that's what most of the field researchers do, too. They'll be walking around filming stuff, talking to the audience. And 
I'm sure this is uh, this may actually work to our advantage when dealing with Bigfoot that are nearby, because they're kind of curious about who the hell are you talking to? Paul Freeman and then ended up losing sight of her. You know, if, at first he says, "Oh, look, there's two of them," and then he tries to reposition. He see, he makes the con. I, I need to get somebody else. See, he he had no confidence in himself. Yeah. Hey, hey, I need to get somebody else up here. You yeah. know, uh, I forgot he mentioned a name there, Wes, Wes Summerlin. Uh, I need to get him up here, you know. Uh, so you're you're stuck there with a Bigfoot. Multiple you know, Bigfoot. <laughs> multiple Bigfoot. Well, in, in the, uh, it's the, the, what do you call that? The chance of a lifetime. The encounter of a lifetime. And you're wishing you were somebody else. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd rather be watching somebody else film this than me personally being right, the one right, doing right. it. Right, uh, right. <laughs> get, get Wes and set him out there, and Wes talk to him. Uh, and that's that, that's probably what I would have been. You know, I, I wouldn't know what to say. I, yeah. I know a I know a word that I think would have meaning. And I, I, I'm pretty sure of this word because it has meaning in so many different Native American languages, and and it's a greeting, and it means it, it, let's see, it's, if I can remember the word, uh, ka hawa, and it, and it means there is an abundance of food and water here. It's it's a it's a friendly reading right and i don't know if i would have ever even thought of that word you know so i did do some research you know what could you say if you ran into a bigfoot yeah you you could try that um at least to let them know that it was it meant no harm hot kahawa it's it goes all the way back to the Maya. The Aztecs, and and it's used all the way up to Canada. <coughs> you know, different different language groups, and it, it has that meaning, meaning of friendliness. Yep. But I may never get that chance again. Well, I don't know. When you come up here and visit me in Montana, it'll probably happen. So just make sure you got your little vocabulary book with you. Whenever they're around up here and I know they're in the area, that's one of the things I usually do is yell hello in various dialects. <laughs> and it seems to have a good result. Then you really got their attention and they're following you around. Well, uh, that's all the way back in 2008. And ha I have not been able to reach that layer since uh ever since then it's been either one year it was a heavy snowfall had brought down a lot of treetops and it was just so difficult to go up the hill having to crawl through those tops oh god uh, i can only imagine and and another time another time it was uh it was everybody had individual reasons not to make it uh things went haywire wrong one person was throwing up another person was uh uh i think don had been mangled his ear yeah you've you know, seen that you guys uh have seen that on a previous show i did with mk where he mysteriously got hurled onto his face by unseen force and then the next guy in line behind mk got zapped and then MK, mk got the confusion zapping well, I, I have heart problems. I, yeah. I was actually, I should not have even been there. I had, I had uh, chest pains. I could go for a little while, then I had to stop. Uh, ended up, I had a 99% blockage in the, the lower anterior descending artery, the widow maker. Hmm. Uh, and the only reason I'm here right now is because a determined uh, in, uh, doctor that, intervened 
they couldn't do a they couldn't do a bypass surgery because of calcium deposits. So they tried three times to put a stent in, and this young doctor, they they decided to let him do it. And I watched him. That's the strange thing about that is you can watch. You're not you're not out of it. And he that artery had kind of a kink in it like that. And every time my heart heart would beat, it would go straighten out a little bit. And he timed it. And when it straightened, he hit it and just jammed it. And it slipped on up in there and the blood flowed. I could feel it in my face. All the people there cheered in the room. I cheered. It was like he took the football in from the three yard line, you know, and got the winning score. <laughs> uh, and it, it, of course, yeah, I'm here today because of that. Uh, so you know, maybe I'll get my second chance at the lair. Sure hope so. I sure hope you get a chance to come up here and do some Bigfooting in Montana, too. There's a lot of interesting stuff up here. And one of the yeah, things I'm on the lead of right now is that there's a, a guy who's not quite as old as me, but he's getting up there. And he's been uh, here his entire life. And he's been hunting here his entire life. He was going out with his dad when he was a little bitty kid. Could barely carry a twenty two, going out hunting. And over the course of this whole time period, he started discovering things that he wasn't particularly wanting to find out. But he said back in the 70s and 80s, it was sort of common knowledge here and all the locals would share with each other what was going on in certain areas so they didn't get in trouble. And now there's a lot more people from other states have moved here and they don't bother to tell them anything. But he's not only found tracks in excess of 30 inches long, clearly not Bigfoot tracks, but the locals around here seem to know which mountain ranges actually have giants in them and actively avoid them. So that's coming up here in the future, just so you guys can get all freaked out about that. Definitely so. That's that's the kind you see on cartoons, you know. <laughs> Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, after he tells after he tells me this, he goes, "Oh yeah, this mountain range and this mountain range and this mountain range." And I went, "Wait, wait, wait. What was that last one? Oh, this one." And I'm like, "You mean where Coloma is, the ghost town? Yeah, the one I've been camping at for ten years. Yeah, the one I found the 31 inch track at last spring. Yeah. Well, thanks for letting me know that there's giants up there. I wouldn't have been doing any research there at all. You know. Oh, well, there, there was one of the early. The early pioneers, uh, I've forgotten the guy's last name. His first name was David, a famous, famous explorer. And he had some Indian guides and they came across this track that was so big that he he thought it belonged to a woolly mammoth. Mm. That's, he, he said, and the Indians wouldn't wouldn't follow it. He told them to go find it. And, and they said, they nope, they refused. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know it, it, and it was you know on the hoof it wasn't a fossilized track it was in the snow right uh, so it, it, there was something at that time you know that was living breathing that was something ginormous huge. ginormous yeah. again I had uh, Papa Craig on my show he's actually been up here bigfooting with me and he was over in the Wallowa Mountains and found a track. He thought it was a mud puddle. It was full of water. And he was looking at it going, what a great optical illusion. Those elk tracks at the front of that big mud puddle make it look like a giant's track. And then he got a little closer and looked at it and went, those aren't elk tracks. Those are toes. Oh, my God. What am I looking at? So he went, well, if there's one track here, there's got to be more. So he went forward a little bit, about 12 feet. And there was another mud puddle with the same layout. And he went, oh, my God, these are tracks. So he followed the tracks, and they didn't go that much further, and they went into this low, swampy area. And at which point you could see the potholes where this thing had stepped into this swamp and walked through it and left these big holes in the swamp, basically. And he just went, well, 
I'm going back over to the other side of the river and I'm not coming over here again. And where he had been is he was camping out there the entire summer and he found out there was an old abandoned Indian trail on the other side of this river from that they had been using for hundreds of years. And so he wanted to go over and explore it. That's when he found those giant tracks. Somebody else is still using that trail. Yeah. Uh, that explorer was David Thompson. Cool. There we I got your a, name for you. Thanks, MK. An, an, an Anti-CRS machine here. I, <laughs> I depend on it. <laughs> Anti-CRS. Good one. <laughs> So, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's interesting. Some of the stuff, the more you dig into this and start looking into it in certain areas and stuff, you start finding things that you didn't ever think they were even there. And sometimes it's stuff that you really don't want to find. And you're not at all happy that that's what you're finding. Because like, oh, I like that area. Now that I know that there's giants there, I don't want to go there anymore. <laughs> you know? That kind of ruined it for me. <laughs> like, it, kind of, it has to hit you. Yeah. You know, if you think it's just a mud puddle with elk tracks around it, well, yeah, you come back. <laughs> but if it hits you, that that's not what it is. Yeah, and this guy's a hunter and a tracker. You know, he was living up there hunting during the summer to, to feed himself. This was after the Vietnam War was over, and he was all disgruntled about society. So he went and lived in the mountains for a summer. Yeah, and then he found, like I said, what you were just saying, when you think it's just a mud puddle with elk tracks in front, it's a cool novelty. But when you look at the elk tracks and realize that those aren't elk tracks, those are toe marks, then that changes your whole reality. Uh, every, everything <laughs> changes. Yep, yeah. Uh, and I, you know, like I said, I found that 31 inch one. That was scary enough. And unfortunately, it had just poured heavily the night before, so it had washed out a lot of the detail on the toes, but still at, uh, you know, indeterminate full length, but over 31 inches. Well, that scales up to a critter that's 16 feet tall. The, I, would know, think, I would think taller than that. Possibly. And the interesting thing was the layout of the foot was more similar to a human than it was a Bigfoot, because all the Bigfoot tracks that I find that are, you know, up much over 18 inches or something most of them are really wide to accommodate all the weight that they're carrying right right the bigger yeah. the bigger they are the more blocky yeah exactly they, they start to become and it's 15 i just got done measuring it he left a nice crater in the ground too so what was that you were just saying johnny i just uh it's 15 from the yeah yeah no before that it's easy the trap <laughs> Once you know what you're looking for. <laughs> well, here in your second consecutive year of actually Bigfooting, you don't seem to be having too much trouble finding them yourself now. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see what else we can I find. Oh, right you guys can see that, I'm sure. Nice crater. Here's a crater. Well, you were looking at my video earlier yeah, when we were coming size. up the hill, and we kept finding all those 15-inch uh, 15 15 inch tracks. tracks. Well, look at how thick his foot side. was. That's obviously a, a young male. But I mean, you know, inordinately wide for that length, really. That's why I looked down. Yeah, and, uh, uh, no arch. And no arch, no. And capable of crushing the ground wherever he's standing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yep. So anyway, that was pretty spectacular. I was really glad that you, you spotted those guys in your video and you put it out. And I, I'm going to leave a link to that below in the show notes. So anybody that wants to go watch the full-length original that he put out. And I encourage all you Bigfoot field researchers to do that because there's still a likely possibility that where he got two of them on video, there's probably another one in there somewhere that he didn't spot yet. And you guys might spot it. And hey, people spot Bigfoot in my videos too. I just got three more screen captures sent to me yesterday going, hey, Duke, look at this. And I'm like, oh, God. Now I got to do another breakdown video. Quit it, you guys. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it, it doesn't hurt to have another set of eyes. Yeah, uh, yep. And that's it, you know, and you get, uh, shows like your size where you got 30,000 subs, I got 25,000. Then you're starting to have an audience big enough that if there's that many eyes on it, and hopefully a few of them aren't looking at it on a cell phone, 
or at least using a computer, if not a big screen TV, they start spotting stuff. You know, and some of these guys are, you know, <clears throat> a good example here would be Figgy Figueroa, who pulled a Bigfoot out of one of my videos that I filmed like 11 years ago and never even noticed. And she's just looking at it going, what the bleep is that? <laughs> and she's got it on a big screen and she's looking at it with a magnifying glass and the whole thing, trying to see if she could see detail and stuff. And she went, yeah, this is a Bigfoot. I'm going to show Duke this. I'm like, cool. <laughs> so everybody, please feel encouraged to go look through all my old videos and find all the Bigfoot in there that I missed. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it'd be uh, it would be interesting if everything that you see with your eyes got recorded. Oh God! <laughs> it might happen one day, you know. Get some kind of uh, interlink between your brain and the great big cloud up there. Yeah, you just put a little uh, micro camera right here on your glass lens, film everything that you're seeing. Well, the they camera. already have that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, they Problem have that. Solved. Actually, the new the, the newest tech that actually has me all enthusiastic is their LiDAR mapping thing that they have for the best cell phones that they've got out now that have like triple lenses, where you can take a picture of a Bigfoot track and it will produce a 3D image of it. Yeah. You can not only see it from the top, you can look at it from the sides. You can look at it from the bottom. You can, you can do that on, on a phone that concerned. doesn't have that. Uh, if, if you... Uh, if you turn the phone sideways and put it near the ground level and just rotate the phone as you pull it over the track and back down to the other side, do like uh, like 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 this right here. Yeah. And it will give you depth perception. Yeah. Yeah, this is, literally maps it, gives you a 3D image, so it's way, way better. And you oh, can look yeah. at it from underneath, you know. And you could you could put it in a uh, 3D printer and carve it out. Yeah, make pretty it, much. Make, make you a, so, a model of it. And what we were talking about earlier, where you've got the the thought to be dermal ridges, were actually the lines of the layering from pouring the plaster in there. If you're taking a 3D map of it with lidar, there's no arguing about it anymore. Those aren't plaster lines because there's no That's plaster right. in the track. That's, That's right. just the track. That's that's a that's a useful tool. Uh, yeah, I want to make all Bigfooters aware that this exists. Because quit wasting your time carrying plaster around with you when you can take a 3D picture of the track. You can get the depth, all of the all of the uh, the, the, the angle of the sides, yep. everything. Yep. Yeah, and you can like when you've got it mapped like that, you can take that image and you can be like. Well, I want to look at it from two inches below ground level. You can do it. I want to look at it like I'm underground looking up at it. You can do it. You can go anywhere around it, 360 degrees, and it gives you that 3D image, exactly how deep it is, all the detail, everything. So that's a very useful tool that everybody that's into big footing needs to know about. Quit playing, carrying a plaster around with you and just start taking LiDAR map 3D images. We are we're in the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. You know, uh, uh, the, the the worst of times would be the ability for a person to hoax. Yeah. You know, with using electronic imaging and stuff. You know, it's and and it's just inevitable. You know, uh, I don't I don't know whether it should cause a person to become jaded. You know, where he doesn't believe anything. Uh. Or, or or you can turn around and use those same identical programs, software programs and stuff to to enhance your own uh, research um, uh, and make it make it much more uh, labor free. It, it's just according to what you want to do with it. Yeah. Uh, my, my suggestion is that you use more than one camera. If you film a Bigfoot, try to film it with two cameras. And I know it's asking a lot, but at least people can say well, can say that you know that clearly it was it was there. It wasn't AI generated, right? Get it from Multiple two different angles, angles on it. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and there there are opportunities where stuff like that could happen. Caveman was telling me he was coming back home, and there was this long bridge across this big open gully that you know, like, is a riverbed, but there's virtually no water in it. And there's all these cars lined up along the side of this bridge, and they're looking. All the people are out of their cars, looking down into the valley. And he's like, "What are they looking at?" And as he comes pulling up closer, you can see there's a Bigfoot down there. There's like eight cars pulled over, watching this Bigfoot from the bridge walking through this valley. So he pulls up behind him, jumps out of his car, and he goes, hey, is anybody filming this? Not a single one of them. They all started scramble. Where's my cell phone? Oh, no, not one of them thought about it. Not even one of them. <laughs> I had a bear, bear pop up in front of me, 20 feet from me. I had a camera around my neck, ready to go. And I ain't touched that camera. <laughs> Me and the bear just kind of stared at each other, and <laughs> I, I said mentally, you know, it's like looking at a bad dog. You know, you can look into his eyes and tell whether he's what his intentions are. You know, uh, well, I kind of looked right into that bear's eyes, and it, it was like uh, I said, "You're not going. You you don't want to do this, do you?" And the bear says, "No," and <laughs> he took off. <laughs> I, I could have had point blank <laughs> could have been video, great this video. Bear. And, I, and if that had been a big foot it'd been the same difference yep i, I well, just sat there and stared another thing that amuses me is everybody talking all tough oh if i saw a big foot i'd be getting it on video for sure and i wouldn't like run away or anything i'd run toward it yeah you know i can number on this many fingers how many researchers i know that will see a bigfoot and run toward it <laughs> kelly shaw's done it uh tom coburn over in germany has done it but tom will tell you oh yeah i'm not scared of bigfoot but if i see an orb i'm running the other way so <laughs> everybody's got certain things they can deal with and other ones no <laughs> i ran toward what i thought to be a bigfoot that was in, in bluff creek at night uh visited our camp i think i told you about it yeah um but i was trying to get an angle where i could catch that get the flashlight on you know and uh the, the i was with some filmmakers from japan and they they did not want me i mean when i started to disappear into the brush and they didn't even have the light i had the light <laughs> Oh, man, they went to holler. And they're like, didn't you guys remember how to get out of here? No. Oh, God, MK, come back. <laughs> That's what I could hear. Wave. MK, MK. <laughs> I, I don't blame them. I mean, I'm not. I, they, they came over here kind of tongue in cheek. And they wanted to go down there where the Patterson film was filmed. And. And ended up finding this this uh, trackway, this unbelievable tracks that were four inches deep. God. And those guys, I told them, I said, y'all have hit the jackpot. This this is very unlikely to happen, and it happened. <laughs> and uh, they I, I went back home and made a TV show out of it, but I, I don't know. You know, I, I can't understand Japanese, and you know, somebody played the part of me. You know? <laughs> it wasn't my voice; it was Japanese. It was, it was like, you know, down deep. Well, at least they gave you a nice, deep, commanding, authoritative voice. So yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a. Uh, one of the things I know, just imagine watching that well with uh you know the subtitles on like an old Godzilla movie or something playing the part of MK Davis uh with the guy that was he was going to do a reenactment of the Patterson film and uh <laughs> the Japanese guy was going to be Roger Patterson and I was going to be the Bigfoot so I just put me a big coat on you know it was October and I went walking across the sandbar and here he comes. He comes running across the creek and falls. Ah! 
<laughs> and it, he didn't go all the way down, but he got his camera soaked. And it threw up a, a this flag there says, uh, your camera has been wetted. You know, do not use. So he ended up having to finish the show with my camera. <laughs> yeah, and everybody gives Roger hell about falling and stumbling, trying to follow Patty and film her. Well, look, even the pro film crew from Japan couldn't do it. He fell in the river. Yeah, I tell you what, he really, he, he, this camera, he loved this camera. I mean, he, he constantly wiped the lens, you know. He, he he never got tired of it, <laughs> and it, it it uh I don't know if it messed it up or what, but it was said moisture in the camera is what it says. Do not use. Yeah, I love I love Japan for how much they're shutter bugs and are just really into photography and stuff. Still, that's what's keeping it alive globally. That's where a lot of the film forum comes from at this point. It's only the Japanese that are making it. So, I mean, that's wonderful. But the other thing that they have that's bad about them, you guys, when you come over here to visit us, um, this country is not a petting zoo. We didn't eliminate all of our deadly predators. We think it's kind of fun to have them in the woods. As a matter of fact, we make we make extras. It's like we're repopulating areas with timber wolves and grizzlies that don't have them anymore. So when you're over here at Yellowstone, don't try and pet the fluffy cows. Those aren't cows. Those are buffaloes. They will kill you. Do not try and pet them. They are not tame. Well, these are pretty experienced guys. They had been to every World Heritage Site in North America uh, before they before they did this thing. And uh, they had uh, made a documentary. Uh, so I assume in anywhere that there was uh, World Heritage Site. Uh, but the Patterson film site was not World Heritage. Uh, it that was, should uh, be. Well, maybe, but they to be a World Heritage Site, they have it has to be returned to the natural wild state. Yeah. Uh, and I I think they've made a pretty good effort at chiseling up those roads and and you know let them go back grow up. Yeah. Uh, so maybe they intend to do that. I know that they proposed it, and the people in Northern California got really upset. And you can go drive through uh, towns like Jefferson, and it's got signs in the windows of these businesses, and they says no monument, no monument, and that's what they're talking about. They call that a monument whenever they make a World Heritage site. Hmm. They they didn't want it. They resisted it. Well, probably why they resisted is because if it's a World Heritage site, then the UN has control of it. That's right. You know, and I want you them lose, to have control, control of nothing. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I tell you what I'll do. I, I'll, I'll, I'll get the all the rest of the footage that I took on that trip, and and try to put it together into something. And because you know there may be there may be something in that footage. That's what I'm saying. All of that. If you're out there filming video and you get a Bigfoot on video. You need to look through every other piece of video you filmed near that same place at the same time because there's a good likelihood you've got more than one on video and you just haven't noticed them yet. Uh, this is about uh, 20, I think it's 25 miles from the any main highway. Yeah, that's far enough out the middle of nowhere for sure. I think the, the main highway would be uh, Highway 96 and they call it the Bigfoot Highway. Right um, the scenic Bigfoot scenic byway. Uh, <laughs> they give it kind of a fancy name. Yeah, it goes right across Bluff Creek, goes across Aikens Creek, Slate Creek. All of those creeks have Bigfoot activity on them. Yeah, it's, it wasn't just Bluff Creek. Uh, Aikens Creek has a campground that people saw. Uh, you go look it up. Aikens Creek Campground uh, and and. You know, reports of Bigfoot sightings. There's, I found a structure on the Klamath River at that, you know, right off from that campground that was, man, 
<laughs> it's made out of driftwood. Uh, I've, I've got video of it too. I, I have to get that for you. Right on. I'd love to yeah, see that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Bigfoot did this. Yeah. Actually, the best examples of that that I've seen so far is from uh, Brown Dwarf, who was on my show one time. And he likes to be around uh, southern Oregon, northern California area and finds huge structures and stuff. And he's found some driftwood structures that were just freaking unbelievable. Uh, you know, like, who the hell put this thing together? Why would no, they bother it, putting it, this it, together? It almost looks pretty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're real, real interesting looking. Don't really serve any we useful back, purpose. We got back to our car from there, and there was a big old giant wad of wildflowers made into a bouquet laying on the ground by the pat by the driver's door. Wow. Well, there's a nice gift. There was nobody else there. Yeah. We well, were except the, only, for the big only foot. people there. <laughs> Nobody else except the Bigfoot. Yeah. I, it must have been him. You never know. If they decide they like you, then, you know, <coughs> you start getting interactions with them. And they've got kind of a strange sense of humor, so you can never be sure exactly what they're up to. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> like little five-year-olds that are acting mischievous. And, oh, my God, what are they up to now? They're not making any noise. They're up to something. <laughs> Anyway, well, thanks so much for coming on the show again, MK. And of course, we're looking forward to having you back here in the future when you want to share some of your epic evidence and all of your longtime research on any of these other subjects. Well, like I said, I was fortunate enough that I did take video. And so now that I'm getting old, um, I don't have to rely totally upon my memory, uh, which is, you know, memories, memories a fickle thing. Yeah, uh, I can go back and refer back to the videos that it's maybe I missed a Bigfoot on them. Maybe I didn't even give it that good a look. If you don't think I remember, I went in there thinking that there were no Bigfoot in there. You know, that was that was my theory. You know what my theory is? That's why Harry Larry photobombed you. <laughs> it could have been. We need to know Bigfoot here. I'm standing right here. I, See I, the tree I, hope, they, I hope they couldn't understand English because I I'm, I'm certainly must have offended them if they could. <laughs> yeah, I hate to tell you, but they, they actually understand English pretty well. They're used to listening to us talking all the time. <laughs> Probably why I photobombed you. What do you mean there's no Bigfoot around here anymore? <laughs> what am I chopped liver? See tree snap right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm I'm just so thrilled for you that you managed to get something like that. And I know personally it is really hard to get them on video. On purpose, accidental in any way, it's difficult. So for, you know, MK, I'm just so thrilled for you. They managed to pull that off. And of all damn places, at Bluff Creek. <laughs> well done, man. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it ends up it was the exact opposite of what I thought it was. That it was one of the places that had uh, a hotbed of activity, Bigfoot activity. You know, it was, it, I thought it was it would be something that would be, you know, no, no better than any place else on the planet. And uh, I could have been more wrong. Yep. You know, all like from there, the from there, all the way back to Mount Shasta. It's about 70 miles. Uh, and that, you know the that, reputation of Mount Shasta. That's weird central right there. It, it is. And they, there's a connection between Mount Shasta and the, the Bluff Creek drainage. Uh, yeah underground connection oh jeez they're making it easier for them to be all over yeah. the place they're yeah. not being able to be spotted while they're doing it right on that uh, oh. that, that that little old creek the little waterfall the brook babbling brook disappeared into a hole in the ground uh -huh. it into the karst system underneath it it came it came somewhere i mean it went somewhere uh 
somewhere underground. Yeah. Yeah, that was the part of the basement plumbing system, probably. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, again, thanks so much for being on the show and spending some time with uh, all of my viewers. Really enjoy having you on here. And, of course, I'm looking forward to having you back again whenever you feel like you want to put some more time into it. And maybe later on this year or next, early next year, have you back on again. Well, thank you for having me on. I would I would love to come back. I, I have I'll uh, I'll find some more of that footage and let you uh, premiere it. Right on. Well, like I told you before, you know, just take all of your your bundle of video that you haven't actually looked through yet, sling it all together and send it to Blaine Tyler. <laughs> and he'll find every Bigfoot in it and two or three that are questionable and probably aren't Bigfoot but look like they're Bigfoot. <laughs> Well, that would be that would be a, a, a good thing. Yeah. Well, he just did that with me. I referenced that yeah. earlier in the show. Somebody sent me some screen captures. That was Blaine. Here's a picture of the screen. Here's the timestamp. Here's zoomed in. Here's a couple of with you know the red loop around them. Here, here they are. <laughs> Thanks, Blaine. So make sure that you're kind to everyone. Uh, safety first, last, and always. Pay it forward. Don't be mean to people if you don't have to be. Uh, don't flip off the mountain giant don't poke dog man with a stick don't punt the puck would you and for god's sake whatever you do do not hug the wookie